Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Daniel Markovitz. He's Guido Calabresi, professor of law at Yale Law School and author of The Meritocracy Trap, How America's Foundational Myth Feeds Inequality, Dismantles the Middle Class, and Devours the Elite. I've been thinking about inequality in America and the world for some time, and like most people, I had been thinking that it was about unbridled capitalism, that age-old conflict between capital and labor, and the notion that working for a salary was never going to make you rich. I've also been raising children in Manhattan, which is super competitive. And along the way, I kept thinking, why are we doing it this way? Why is this so intense? I don't remember my childhood being this intense. When I saw the book, I thought, this is very interesting. It addresses both the question of inequality and the issue of anxiety and competition in modern life. An enormous share of the increase in the riches portion of total national income does not come from a shift away from labor and towards capital, but rather a shift within labor, away from middle class labor and towards super skilled labor. You know, the partners who make $5 million a year at law firms, the bankers who make five or $10 million a year, the CEOs who make $20 million a year. That's all labor income. And that's what's driving inequality in the United States today. We discuss the roots of inequality being meritocracy and what this means for us as human beings across the board, whether you are in the middle class, the elite, or the working class. And further, how meritocracy is eroding our democracy. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I saw your book and I thought, The title, The Meritocracy Trap, sounds immediately relatable and understandable. You read it and you think, yeah, I got that. But actually, it's quite complex. How do you define it? Great. So one of the central aims of the book is to attack meritocracy. And that doesn't sound like it's a very promising line of argument. It's hard to object to the idea that people should get ahead based on their own accomplishments and not, say, their parents' social class. We have that intuition for two reasons. The first is we think that meritocracy will deliver a a competent, a skilled, a hardworking, a productive elite. It won't be sort of playboy children of princes. It'll be people who earn their way up and are working hard. And the second reason we kind of like meritocracy is that um, we think it's fair. You know, not everybody is born to rich parents, but everybody has natural ability and effort. And so meritocracy gives everyone a fair shot at success. And the basic claim of the book is that both those things are, are more nearly the opposite of the truth that what meritocracy does is it distorts the way in which we work and the way in which we make things and reduces society's well-being. And on the other hand, because rich parents can train their children in the way in which ordinary parents can't, meritocracy itself, when it operates exactly as advertised, in fact blocks opportunity for most people. And an essential part of this is that in the United States today, an enormous share of the increase in the riches portion of total national income does not come from a shift away from labor and towards capital, but rather a shift within labor, away from middle class labor and towards super skilled labor. You know, the partners who make $5 million a year at law firms, the bankers who make 5 or $10 million a year, the CEOs who make $20 million a year. That's all labor income. And that's what's driving inequality in the United States today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it also explains why there is so much misgiving from the people who benefit from these outsized incomes, because I hear them all the time saying, but I'm working really hard, and the person in the middle class really isn't working hard, and that's why that person is not making my kind of money. Right. So another part of meritocracy is it produces a kind of exclusion of the middle class from real economic advantage. And part of the book is to document that this is structural exclusion. It's not a result of any individual failing in any person. It's a result of the structures of training and work that mean that there isn't enough good training, there aren't enough good jobs. But then the second thing that meritocracy does is it adds a kind of a moral insult to this economic injury because it frames, characterizes what's really structural exclusion as an individual failure to measure up. So it tells the person who didn't get into Harvard or the person who doesn't get the job at Goldman or at Google or at Apple, If you were just a little smarter, if you were just a little more hardworking, if you were just a little better, if you had just a little more merit, 
you would have got that. And the reason you don't have it is that it's your fault, that you're not good enough. When in fact, the reason why people don't have it is that they went to a public school where they get, you know, ten to twelve thousand dollars a year spent on their education, and the kids at Phillips Andover get seventy-five thousand dollars a year spent on their education. And unsurprisingly, that difference means that when it comes time to apply to college or to look for jobs, the kids who got all the fancy education get out ahead. That sounds totally logical. Let's talk about this education bit because this is really at the heart of the matter in how. The meritocracy today acts more like an aristocracy. Yeah. So, think about ways in which families pass their privilege down through the generations. So, the way in which the aristocrats did it is just by dying. You owned an estate, you had a title, you died, and your firstborn son, in most cases, all in some cases, daughters, just inherited your estate and your title. The way in which meritocrats do this is different. What they do. Is from the point of birth of their children, they invest enormous amounts of energy and care and skill, and lots and lots of money, in educating their children, in getting their children not physical or financial capital, not land or factories or stocks and bonds, but human capital, training, skill, and the children then use that human capital to capture the jobs that pay the enormous wages we were talking about. And the cycle continues into the next generation. If you want to think about this numerically, if you take the difference between what a typical one percent household spends on educating its children, and a typical middle class household, and imagine that every year you invested that difference not in education, but in the S and P five hundred, to give to the children as an inheritance on the death of the parents, that would be more than ten million dollars per child. And that's the extent of the dynastic transmission of wealth and privilege. Through education, under a condition of meritocratic inequality. That's a huge number. First of all, you research this book so deeply, and you have so many numbers, and it really lays out the case in economic terms, in how the elite really is heads and shoulders ahead of the race than anybody in the middle class. There's basically no contest. There's no way to compete. Unless you're extraordinarily gifted or extraordinarily lucky, as a middle class person in America, you have a very hard time competing. That's right. It's almost impossible. It it does happen, but one of the things that you talk about also in terms of the education, in terms of the work, to return to your point that this is actually a conflict within labor. Essentially, the people who are superordinate workers, you call them. Are exploiting themselves in order to make gobs of money. Talk to us a little bit about what that actually does to humans. Think about it this way: Suppose that I own a factory or an estate. I'm rich, but my wealth is held in physical capital or financial capital. What I can do is I can mix my wealth with other people's labor, with farmers or factory workers. And I can extract some of the returns, and I get income from my wealth without working myself. And so, physical or financial capital makes me free. I can spend my time doing whatever I want and still get income. But now, suppose that my wealth is all held not as physical or financial capital, but as human capital. My own accumulated training, so all those years of schooling, and it's all in my training in me. Well, the only way I can get income out of that wealth is by mixing it with my own labor. And I have to mix it with my own labor, where I work all the time, and I have to work at whatever job the market tells me pays the most. There's a sense in which human capital more nearly enslaves me than frees me. Physical capital frees me, but human capital enslaves me, and I have to yield intensive and alienated labor. In a Marxist sense, I exploit myself. Now, of course, I'm rich because. Whereas traditional exploited labor doesn't even get the economic benefit of its exploitation, whereas elite exploited labor, because it exploits itself, gets the benefit. But that doesn't mean it's good for you in human terms. It means that you are selling yourself to the market, not doing the things you care about when you care about it, but doing what other people command you to do in order to keep your income up. And that's the condition of the meritocratic elite in America today. It's pretty punishing, and yet. We don't feel that we can escape it because once you step onto that treadmill, <laughs> you can't get off. It's very hard because, first of all, if you get off, you lose your income. 
And second of all, your whole life you've been trained to do this thing. I mean, that's what these schools do to children. They train them to want this thing and to do this thing. And of course, we should be clear that if you're in the middle class, you have no reason to be sympathetic to people who have this particular problem. Like, this is a rich person's problem. If you're a rich person, this is a real problem in your life, and and you'd be better off if you could find a different way of organizing your life. For sure. Well, one of the points that you make in your book, which I found incredibly shocking and completely disheartening, is that you offset the real cost of meritocratic inequality to our society at large from the giant amount of incomes that the elite can make and that you've basically done the calculation and you concluded that elite's true product may be near zero. Yeah, so how should we think about that? Let's take home mortgage finance. You know, this is the part of finance that allows people to borrow against their future income to live in houses that they can't yet afford because they're going to pay for it out of their future wages. So it used to be that the way in which home mortgage finance worked is there was someone called a loan officer. And the loan officer was a middle-class, mid-skilled person who decided whether individual loans were going to be repaid and was paid relatively well in order to make that decision accurately. Today, the loan officer is totally de-skilled. The loan officer helps you fill in forms on some machine-scorable chart. And the loans don't need to be accurately made because super-skilled workers are going to securitize those loans make them into derivatives, trade them on Wall Street, and the super-skilled workers can get incredibly rich, and the loan officer is no longer a middle-class person, is not paid very well. Now, here's the interesting thing. The old style of finance, the best economic estimates suggest, was exactly as efficient as the new style. So it's not that the new style is an innovation that makes society richer. The new style is just a way of displacing middle-class people with a lot of working-class or poor people and a few rich people. And in the new style, the rich people are incredibly productive. But if you compare the new arrangement to the old arrangement overall, we're no better off. And that's the sense in which I want to say the elite's true product is close to zero because the system in which they're rich doesn't make us better off. That is uh, incredibly damning, in fact. Let's unpack how meritocracy is actually a sham and just an illusion. Let's take that example that I gave, sort of play it out into kind of a parable. Imagine you have a society in which there are farmers and there are warriors. And the society lives at peace with its neighbors, and the farmers farm, and the warriors secure the borders, and everybody does pretty well, and the wealth of the society is shared evenly among everybody. And then one day, one of the warriors attacks the neighbors, starts a fight. And you get border skirmishes, and the border skirmishes replicate, and you get war all the time. And now the society is on a war footing, constantly at war with its neighbors. And once it's on a war footing, the warriors say, we are the most important, most productive people in this society. Because if it weren't for us, you'd all be overrun and killed. And so the warriors say, we get all the status, we get all the wealth. And the farmers might say, well, I get that now. But that wouldn't be true if you hadn't started the war. And the warrior's claim that they're so productive is entirely an artifact of their own warmongering. And that's the sense in which it's a sham. It's not true that they're sort of naturally or inevitably productive. They're productive only where their skills are the dominant skills. Similarly, what I want to say about meritocrats in America today is that they have remade the economy in a way specifically designed to favor their own unusual skills. While they are very productive in some sense in our society, if there weren't so much inequality, then they wouldn't be so productive. And so to say that their productivity justifies the inequality is like committing a circle, right? It can't be that it justifies the inequality when the inequality is a condition of the productivity. And that's the sort of technical sense in which it's a sham. It's not really a good thing. It's just like an ideological construction designed to make inequality okay when inequality isn't okay. Right, right. It really isn't. (music) 
So where does this leave the middle class now that we've spoken about the elite who really are exploiting themselves, essentially enslaving themselves, but still are doing, doing pretty well, doing really, really well. So the middle class is in trouble. This is commonplace in American public culture now, but it's worth emphasizing just how deep the trouble is that wages are basically stagnant. Even in moments when unemployment is relatively low, labor force participation is not very high. For people who don't follow the economics data, unemployment is the share of people who want work but don't have work, roughly speaking. Labor force participation tells you how many people are actually working. And the reason you can have low unemployment but not high labor force participation is a lot of people may have stopped looking for work. And that's not because the middle class is lazy. It's because there aren't enough good jobs. And if there aren't good jobs, you're less likely to look for work. So even now, the middle class does not have enough good jobs, even when unemployment is low. So that's another problem. In addition, there is this insult that we talked about earlier, that meritocracy tells people who are excluded through no fault of their own that it is their own fault. And this is coming together to produce the sort of epidemic of suicide and drug addiction and overdose and alcoholism that is sort of the direct physical result of the kind of insult and exclusion that the American middle class is being subjected to. And this is a, a big and very damaging phenomenon. Yeah, it is. It spills over life everywhere, and it spills into our politics. One of the things you say in your book is that nativism and populism are, of course, knee-jerk reactions to this condition, but that they are missing the mark in addressing the problem. How so? So first of all, one of the things that's happened is that not just in the U.S., but also in some European countries, sort of right-wing populists were the first people to see the struggles of the middle class. And so they spoke to the middle class. They get what's going on in your life and everybody else is telling you what's wrong with you. The other thing is that, particularly on the nativist side, there's a way in which the elite uses its commitment to diversity and inclusion, which is partly a real commitment driven by the fact that there's all kinds of racism and bigotry in the world that ought to be fought and needs to be stamped out. That's the sincere part of this. But the other part of this is that the diversity and inclusion ideal makes it possible for the elite to say, we're open, we're meritocratic, we accept everybody. If you don't make it, it's your fault. Because look, we accepted this person from another culture or this person of another race. And that shows that it really is a meritocracy. And so certain kinds of identity politics are used to launder economic inequality. And the middle class that is excluded, if you're a white, Christian, straight, working class, middle class man in America today, you don't feel privileged. Now, that's not to say that there isn't such a thing as white privilege. It's totally real. But in your own life, there are lots of ways in which you're also not at the top. And then you're told no, 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 you're privileged, and the only reason that you aren't rich is that in spite of your privilege, you're not virtuous enough to make it. Well, that's not going to make you attracted to equality. It's going to make you attracted to nativism. And so that's the kind of story that is also played out here, and, and demagogues are incredibly good at exploiting that logic. Right, yeah. Well, Meritocracy really undermines democracy. The rules are not the same for everybody, as you've just explained. But one other thing that people are just beginning to understand is just how much the elite can do to tip the balance in their favor, politically. Absolutely. And it's not just politically. So politically, the way they do it, for example, is they dominate campaign contributions. They maybe control media markets. But there's another part of it which is that they use what we don't think of as politics. We think of it as professional services. They hire accountants. They hire bankers. They hire lawyers. And what they do is they hire these people to use the existing laws. This isn't necessarily lobbying or cheating. This is using the existing laws to make it very, very hard for the government to take their wealth. So tax shelters, perfectly legal tax shelters, if you're rich enough, you can deploy lawyers and accountants in such a way that you pay very little tax. And that part of the meritocratic elite's self-dealing 
is particularly dangerous precisely because it's legal. Because what it does is it causes everybody else to mistrust the rule of law. And then you get another kind of populism, which is also not a good thing. How did you come up with this idea to write this book? Everybody thinks it's really capitalism, but you're the only one who really offers, so far in my mind, a different perspective and a different theory. You know, I guess there are two kinds of sources. I've been thinking about inequality for a long time, from back when I was writing my PhD. And uh, I got in some back and forth, just in scholarly journals with some other people, and I thought I was right and they were wrong. And um, then sort of slept on it, not for a night, but for like a year or two. And I was like, oh, well, maybe, maybe they're right and I'm wrong. <laughs> and, and so out of that thought, I thought, well, maybe I need to rethink what's going on. So that was one part of it. And then the other part of it was just interacting with my students and seeing that on the one hand, they're incredibly privileged. They've had great lives. Everybody tells them they're great, and yet they're not happy. And also, there's a connection between their incredible wealth and everybody else's exclusion. And so I started thinking about, well, what's that connection, and why are they unhappy, and how are those two phenomena related? And I guess that's the origins of it. Yeah, it's a a really powerful book to come out, especially at this time, to rethink why we have so much inequality and to rethink possible solution. But it's not easy. Let's talk about the solutions that you propose, because these are long ranging projects that will not (laughs) make our society better overnight. And as you argue, of course, and as we all know, having lived on this planet together, (laughs) is that it took years to get here. So it's going to take years to undo. I mean, the last thing you said is really important to begin with that, you know, this is a, a civilizational development. It's taken half a century to get us here. The idea that we can fix it in a year or with a law is just a fantasy. So what has to happen? You have to change hearts and minds. You have to build a new politics. You have to start incrementally making policies. And you have to aim at policies that have the feature that as they get implemented, they grow stronger rather than weaker. So what does that mean practically? First thing it means practically about politics is one of the reasons I spend a lot of time in the book arguing that the system is not good for the rich is that when you have concentrated wealth, you have to persuade rich people to give some of it up. And rich people have a lot of power. And there are two ways to get them to give it up. One is with pitchforks and revolution, and the other is by persuading them. And most of the time in society, when we've had as concentrated wealth as we have now, it's been pitchforks and revolution. And um, that doesn't usually end well for anyone. And so the idea is, if you can persuade the elite you think you're winning, but you're not, that might open the elite up to a kind of politics that would change things. And then you have to persuade the middle class that your enemy is not the immigrant, not the person of color, not the worker in China or India. Your enemy is a system that you're within and that you have the power to change. And then you can try to build a coalition for a a positive politics of structural reform. That's the first thing. Now, what do you do to reform it structurally? Well, the two movements that have got us this inequality are a concentration of education in rich kids and a concentration of work in educated people. And so the policies should aim at distributing education across more people and distributing work across more people. And that's things like opening up private schools or elite universities or elite public schools to lots more kids, changing the way they're funded, changing who gets to go where, and favoring middle-class jobs in our tax structure so that we don't tax middle-class workers as highly, and using regulation to favor ways of making things that use middle-class workers over elite workers, those sorts of things. And we can talk in detail about what they all would be, but the important thing is to get the politics right. And then the policy will build on itself. I like the policies that you proposed in the book. In terms of education, I think that's going to be a super hard sell to open up private education. And you talked about their tax status and their giant endowments and all this. It is, but if I could just say... Tell us. If you go to these schools... The kids in those schools are not happy. 
And the families that are sending the kids to those schools are not happy about the way their children's childhoods are going. And if they can understand that the reason why they have these sources of unhappiness is that they're so exclusive, they're so competitive, they're all grasping for a shrinking, shrinking, shrinking brass ring. If they can understand that, then it might make it easier to open up the schools. There's this myth that we have that you can be in meritocracy, both rich and free. And that's not true. So you have to choose. And if you're willing to be a little less rich, you can be a lot more free. If people can understand that, I think that there's a possibility for reform that is not available if people don't understand it. I totally agree with you. Having said that, I think that is a very difficult thing to understand. Yeah. Especially if you have been entrapped in this cycle. Totally right. And you are playing the game at 100%. Before we started the interview, you were talking about that I grew up in Europe and I said, you know, we didn't live like this. And every time when I look at my children, I think this is just so demanding. I don't know why we're doing it this way. And of course, reading the book elucidates that. But still, the experience is really of outsized anxiety at all times. Completely so. And um, one of the reasons why I think it's the young people who are most likely to push back against this. And we're starting to see it with the rising political engagement of you know, high school and college students including some very privileged ones. Sometimes their political engagements reflect their privilege in a not great way, but I think they're more right than wrong, and they're going to force the rest of us to acknowledge that. Yeah, I hope so. When I talk to other parents, I always ask, how much longer are we going to do this? Because at some point, we're going to break collectively because we can't take it anymore to live at this level of competition with each other at all times. And, and the other thing is that young people are beginning to see if they're privileged. Hey, you know, my privilege is pretty directly related to everybody else's exclusion. That's the other part of this. It's not just you. It's the whole society that's being harmed by this. Exactly. So, well, let's pivot back to reframing work so that we can have more middle-class jobs. And one of the proposals you have is to eliminate the income cap on Social Security payroll taxes. Can you talk about that? So for most middle-class American families, the single biggest tax they pay is not the income tax. It's the wage tax, which is the Social Security and Medicare payroll tax. And that comes in at you know round numbers, 15% of their income. It's less than that, a little less. That tax is applied to only right now, roughly speaking, the first $130,000 of income. After that, the Social Security part goes away and Medicare tax continues, roughly speaking. And what that means is that if you add up the income tax that's applied to somebody making, say, $100,000 a year and the Social Security wage tax, that labor is the single highest taxed factor of production in our whole economy. It's taxed more highly than someone who's making $2 million a year in labor income. It's taxed more highly than capital. And so we have a huge tax incentive for employers to replace twenty hundred thousand dollars a year workers with one $2 million a year worker and robots. And if you care about the middle class, that's exactly backwards. And so the first thought is, well, let's keep the Social Security wage tax all throughout so that if you make $2 million a year, you're paying the Social Security wage tax on all $2 million. And that would raise, the estimates are roughly 1.5% of GDP in steady state. And that would be enough money that could be used to fund the expansion of education that the book also talks about so that these two programs could go together. Now, of course, the rich would be taxed more. On the other hand, the rich are rich enough that they don't really need the income and everybody else will be better off. And if you use the funding for the schools to make elite schools much more open, they might even let a few more rich kids in, which would reduce the competition within the elite. So there really is a way in which, in human terms, everybody could be made better off by these kinds of reforms. Yeah. It's great that you wrote the ideas on how to potentially solve these problems, because a lot of people are like, oh, here's a problem. Let's think about it. <laughs> you know, but that's not what you did. I'm very, very impressed. So what did you learn about humans and humanity that you didn't expect to learn while you were writing this book? That's a really good question. 
I think I learned two kinds of things. One really sort of general thing, which is the way in which people's imaginative lives and the economic structures that they live in interact. So, you know, one of the big questions in understanding history and social phenomena is, you know, academics call it the distinction between materialism and idealism. So one view, the materialist view, is that everything is determined by the economic structure, by the means of production. You know, Marx has called that the base. And then principles of justice or religion or culture, that's called superstructure, and it doesn't actually explain anything. And the other extreme is the idealist view, which says that it's our ideas and what's in our head and our imaginary that drives everything. And the base is not relevant. And one of the things that I learned in writing this book is the way in which the two interact. That you have a set, certain set of economic arrangements which make it the case that elite labor and industry are incredibly valuable, which causes elites to start to value industry, whereas previously they despised it which causes them to train their children differently, which then causes us to deploy different kinds of economics. And so these feed back into each other. Now that's kind of abstract. I think the more concrete thing, you know, I spent a couple days in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, uh, which I picked for a variety of reasons, but including it was a town that gave Kennedy a landslide once and gave Trump a landslide more recently. Talking to people there who are Trump supporters, it became clear to me just how little faith they had, not just in the Democratic Party or in the Democratic establishment, but in the underlying institutions and rules of American society. And when I spoke to people, everybody I spoke to recognized that there is a kind of human sense in which you know, Donald Trump as a person was depraved or unreliable or not admirable. They also saw that he was attacking and undermining institutions, but they did not care because they thought that the institutions were anyway corrupt and dysfunctional. And it's very hard to make a political argument against a populist if his supporters see what you see and don't care. It's because they had an experience of life in which, in fact, these institutions were not working and were dysfunctional. So again, they were more right than wrong. And, and that's the challenge of the politics of our time, I think, in a nutshell. So that's something that I got from, from talking to people about the book. Yeah, those are great insights. So as an everyday person, what could I be doing? Two things I could be doing to help make this civilizational sure. change happen because you have to start somewhere. Yeah, one is personal. People can always say that consciousness raising is a waste of time, but I don't think it is. Wherever we are in this distribution, if we're in the middle class, you know, say to ourselves, to our children, to our friends, the problem is not the immigrant. The problem is the structure. Say to our children, you know, if you're not getting into the college that you would like to get into, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's a system, and that's what you should push against. So that if you're in the elite, tell people, you don't deserve this. You're not as great as you think you are. This is not good for you anyway. And with our children, if we're in the elite, do the best we can to get them some perspective. And so that's the personal part. The political part is to find the candidates that you think, both locally and nationally, who have the right account of the problem and vote for them. Don't worry so much about the particular solutions they're pushing because those are not going to survive the face of the legislative battles that follow. But you want somebody who has the right diagnosis and that's who you want to support. That's very good advice for this upcoming election. Last question. Sure. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? I think three things make me hopeful. Um, one is that the society that has done the best job in history of unwinding extreme inequality is actually the United States that did it in 1929 following the crash and the depression. The second is that 
it really is true that this kind of inequality is good for nobody. And because it's good for nobody, everybody has most reason to resist it. So I think if people understand what's going on, they'll be able to see what needs to be done. And then the third is just the younger people, my students, high school kids, you know, people I interact with or see on the news, who I think are engaged and increasingly active and courageous and capable. And I think there's a good chance they're going to force the rest of society to do what the rest of society lacks the imagination and will to do. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. While reading the book and during the interview, I felt immense discomfort. After all, I am myself a product of this system, and I too actively participate in trying to bestow as good an education as possible to my children. Moreover, my thinking was stuck in the paradigm of blaming unbridled capitalism for the current level of inequality. It isn't, of course, that free market capitalism has nothing to do with the problem. For sure, it is because of capitalism that these enormous wages are even possible and that providing alienated labor can even be a thing. What struck me most deeply about this conversation is that being both rich and free is at the core of the myth. It simply isn't true. Working 80 hours a week is not freedom. And this pressure starts plenty early. Within a week of publishing this episode, a 10th grader in an elite private school in Manhattan committed suicide. Is this really the society that we want to live in? The thesis of meritocracy as the root of inequality, in my mind, is a new way of thinking about the problem precisely because it identifies inequality as being a struggle within labor. It seems to me that this is something that we can decide to solve. The challenge is in persuading the meritocrats that changing the system will benefit them. I hope that we do, and that we find a way to be humane and reorganize our lives and our values around humanity. Next week, our guest is Thomas Apt, He is a senior fellow at the Council on Criminal Justice, and last summer he published his book, Bleeding Out, The Devastating Consequences of Urban Violence and a Bold New Plan for Peace in the Streets, while he was still at Harvard Kennedy School. We discuss proven strategies to end urban violence, what it means to be both overburdened and underprotected by law enforcement, and how undeniably important it is to save lives and help create safe communities. The argument that I make in the book is that we need to address violence first. I'm not making the argument that if you reduce violence, poverty will cure itself or that it's the only thing we need to do. I'm not even suggesting that it's the most important thing. What I'm simply suggesting is that it's the first thing in order of sequence, because if you can tackle violence, if you can give people a measure of safety, security, stability, Everything else to improve people's lives in that community becomes easier. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service.